Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be talking about the synthesis of perfluorocubane. So I know there's been a few article posts online about perfluorocubane, but I'm pleased to say that today you're going to get to see the first pictures of perfluorocubane online. I reached out to the authors to see if they had any pictures of their chemicals, and they were kind enough to give me permission to use them for this video, so I really hope you enjoy the pictures throughout this presentation. There's several of them, and it's really cool to see how these compounds look. Some of the pictures in this video are the most beautiful crystals I've ever seen in my life, so make sure you watch all the way to the end because there's some really great pictures throughout this. So this is perfluorocubane. This is the first picture. I thought I'd include one here just to whet your appetite. This is one of several pictures throughout this episode. And as you can see, it's a white powder. That seems a little bit unremarkable, but later on you're going to find out just how remarkable it is. Like I said, most beautiful crystals I've ever seen. So what is perfluorocubane, and why should you care? So it was just reported a couple weeks ago in the journal Science that perfluorocubane was synthesized, and not only did the authors synthesize it, they also added an electron to it. Now this is a little bit misleading because this might lead you to believe that it was isolated, but we're going to talk about why that wasn't quite the case later. So if you've never heard of cubane before, this molecule is literally a cube, except in this case, instead of having hydrogen sticking off of each of the carbons, they actually have fluorines. Cubane was first synthesized in the 1960s by Philip Eaton, and even octanitrocubane has been synthesized also by Philip Eaton. However, it wasn't until this year that we got octafluorocubane, also known as perfluorocubane. So the authors took two different approaches to the synthesis of perfluorocubane. The first approach that I'm going to be talking about, which is the one that they highlight in the main body of their manuscript, is the use of cubane carboxylic acid. However, in their supporting information, they also discuss the use of 1,4-cubane dicarboxylic acid as the precursor for perfluorocubane. Now, the ultimate method that they highlight in their paper is just using the monocarboxylic acid, but both are viable routes. And so the reason that they did it this way, instead of just starting with cubane, it was reported that when cubane was fully fluorinated, it decomposed during the process, and it wasn't possible to fluorinate effectively. So what these authors did is they made these analogs where they have fluorinated ester derivatives, and these fluorinated esters allow the rest of the cubane to be fully fluorinated, and afterwards they're able to cleave off this ester group and then put on the last one or two fluorines. This is following something that's called perfect fluorination, which I'll briefly touch on later. And you can see that both for the monoester and the diester, they use this interesting highly fluorinated alcohol derivative. After they installed that ester group, it was possible to fully fluorinate the cubane, both for the mono and the dicarboxylic acid derivative. The next step for them was to hydrolyze and decarboxylate the carboxylic acid to give the CH analog. Here you can see they have seven and six of the corresponding fluorines installed, and they're almost there. Finally, through a subsequent fluorination, they arrive at perfluorocubane. So let's get started with the first route. The first route utilizes this monocarboxylic acid ester, and they do this thing called perfect fluorination. Perfect fluorination utilizes a perfluoroalkyl ester derivative, and the reason for this is it deactivates the cubane just a little bit. This is an idea that's applied to fluorination broadly speaking, so if you're struggling with a fluorination, one way to accomplish this is to use this perfect method. So in their case, they screened analogs of the cubane where different alcohol groups were present on this ester, and they found that other fluorinated groups led to lower yields and sometimes had poor solubility. Additionally, they tried putting a CH2 where this carbonyl is, and they ended up having an ester on the other side, and the issue for that was when they fluorinated it, they didn't get any of the product out. They believed the presence of that methylene group once a radical was formed led to decomposition of the cubane ring. So they ended up going with an ester in this position. So using 24 equivalents of 20% fluorine and nitrogen in this solvent called CFE419, they were able to convert this to the corresponding heptafluoro derivative. Now they didn't isolate it at this stage. You can imagine that having all these fluorines might be really complicated to analyze. A fluorine NMR for something like this would be a nightmare. And so what they do is they do a transesterification. And in this case, they transesterify with benzyl alcohol. Once they have this product, they're able to characterize it. And I just want to highlight that in the supporting information, it states that three days were required for this transformation, although in the body of the manuscript it only reports one day. The yield over two steps was 8.8%, giving them 65 milligrams of this material to push forward. Once they had this benzyl ester, they were able to hydrolyze it under mild conditions using lithium hydroxide at 60 degrees Celsius for three days, giving them a 76% yield and 23 milligrams of heptafluorocubane. And I'm pleased to say we actually have a picture of what heptafluorocubane looks like. You can see it's a white powder. Now, this isn't crystalline, so you can't quite see any of the shapes of the cubes here, but it's cool to see that this is heptafluorocubane. Very cool to see, for sure. So the last step for this transformation was to lithiate that position with a base called lithium HMDS. This is just a strong base. Once it's lithiated, it's treated with NFSI, which is an electrophilic fluorinating agent. This acts as if it was F+, even though it isn't exactly F+, you can treat it as if it's an F+. 
and this anion is able to attack the fluorine of NFSI, putting the 8th fluorine on, and this is the method that they highlight in the body of their manuscript. You can see that they achieved this in 51% yield, giving them 10.5 milligrams of perfluorocubane. So this was the first approach they took, now I'm briefly going to talk about the second approach. The second approach utilizes the diester, as I was mentioning earlier. They use essentially the same technique, with the same number of equivalents of fluorine, and they get the hexafluorodiester species through this method. But again, they don't isolate it, they transesterify. Now in this case, they don't transesterify with benzyl alcohol, but rather they transesterify with methanol, and this is a little bit quicker of a reaction, done in only 22 hours, giving them a yield of 213 milligrams in a 32% yield over two steps. And I'm also pleased to say that we have a picture of this diester species. This one also looks quite nice, but it also looks a little bit like sugar. So the next step was for them to hydrolyze this. So they hydrolyze this to the corresponding dicarboxylic acid. I didn't highlight this earlier, but it's well known that perfluorocarboxylic acids readily undergo decarboxylation. This is like a rule of thumb, so for stuff like Gen X, Gen X is readily decarboxylated. This undergoes decarboxylation, affording them with hexafluorocubane in 99% yield, giving them 103.4 milligrams to push forward. And I'm also pleased to say we have a picture of the hexafluorocubane as well. Again, I'd like to thank Masafumi for sending these pictures, they look absolutely beautiful. And I was so excited to see these pictures. If you think these pictures are good, just wait till you see perfluorocubane. So the last step for this transformation was to once again deprotonate those CHs and trap them with an electrophilic fluorine source. In this case they didn't use lithium HMDS, they used P4TBU, which is a bulky non-nucleophilic base. And in this case when they utilized this methodology they were only able to get a 5% conversion giving them half a milligram of perfluorocubane. Even so, this is still quite an impressive feat. So earlier on I mentioned that they were able to trap an electron in this and reduce this to a radical anion species. So they were able to do this two different ways. The first way was utilizing electricity in cyclic voltammetry. However, when they did this reduction, they observed that it was an irreversible reduction. So once this radical anion formed, it led to decomposition. They weren't able to reoxidize it back to perfluorocubane. And so to prove that they were actually forming this radical anion, they ended up utilizing ionizing radiation in this interesting technique. This interesting technique essentially has a matrix of hexamethylethane, also known as tetramethylbutane as the matrix, and they had 1% of their sample in this matrix, and when it's irradiated with a gamma ray source, which was cobalt-60, this ionizing radiation is able to knock an electron off of the matrix, creating a radical cation on the matrix, and putting an electron into the perfluorocubane. They then subjected this to a technique known as EPR, which stands for Electron Paramagnetic Resonance. It's a way that people are able to study unpaired electrons. This is also sometimes referred to as electron spin resonance, also known as ESR, spectroscopy. If you're interested in looking at a paper that talks about this radical cation species in the matrix, you can check out this article shown here. They actually characterize this, and it turns out that that sigma bond between the two quaternary centers is actually where the electron gets taken from, which I thought was kind of interesting. So this figure from their manuscript really highlights some interesting stuff here. You can see that they study the properties of perfluorocubane, heptafluorocubane, as well as hexafluorocubane. This is the UV vis spectra, and that corresponds to the energy gap between the HOMO and the LUMO. The HOMO is the highest occupied molecular orbital, that's the orbital that's currently filled, and the LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And so that's the empty orbital where a new electron could go. So if they form the radical anion, that's where the electron's going to go. So you can see this big green cube inside the cubane, that's the electron density where that new electron will go. So when they end up forming the radical anion, that's where the electron's located for the most part. So you can see that this took about 2.8 volts to reduce. That's comparable to the reduction potential of lithium metal, for instance. And when they were looking at this species by EPR, they have this big blob here, which is from radical cations and other radicals from the matrix. However, because there's eight fluorines, they have a spin multiplicity of nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that fits really well with the simulated spectrum. The only difference here being that the experimental spectrum had those contaminating radicals from the matrix but this does demonstrate that they do have this product. They also studied the reduction potentials of the heptafluoro and the hexafluoro, although since we're here for perfluorocubane, we're just focusing on perfluorocubane. And so this is from their supporting information. They discuss the procedure for the two different synthetic routes, and they report that it's a colorless solid, and here it says it's a crystalline solid. And so I'm really glad that the authors had pictures of this, and I can't wait to share them with you. But before I show you those pictures, let's briefly talk about the characterization of this compound. You can see that all of these carbons are the same, so in the carbon NMR you'd expect a single signal, and the same goes for the fluorine. All of these fluorines are in the same chemical environment, so you should only see a single signal. It is also interesting to note that they were able to measure the melting point, and the melting point was reported to be between 160 and 171 degrees Celsius. They also obtained crystals for X-ray crystallography so that they were able to prove the structure. X-ray crystallography is a really good way to identify a structure that can complement mass spec and NMR really well. 
So if you can get a single crystal and you can solve the crystal structure, you can definitively prove what you have. And so as shown earlier, this is a picture of perfluorocubane. And the next picture is the really good picture. So these are crystals of perfluorocubane. Now these aren't single crystals, so they ended up having to grow single crystals from these for x-ray crystallography. But just look at these for a second. These are literally cubes. These are cube-shaped crystals. That these crystals look exactly like perfluorocubane does on a molecular scale. So here I've included a space-filling model of perfluorocubane, and you can see that not only are they cubes, they even have the balls on the corner just like the space-filling model, which is absolutely amazing. And to show you a really good shot of this, I have a zoom in right here. You can see that they're actually square, exactly the same shape as the space filling model. And so these crystals are absolutely beautiful. I think these are the most beautiful crystals I have ever seen. So in terms of the spectroscopy, here's the fluorine NMR. You can see that there's a single signal at 197 ppm in the fluorine NMR. This is pretty upfield, which is kind of interesting. In the carbon NMR, they have a single signal at 104 ppm. They also did an HSQC to show that the fluorine and the carbon are associated to the same signal, just to really prove that this is from the compound. Now, earlier I mentioned that they got x-ray crystallography data. Here's the crystal structure that they got from their compounds. They got crystal structures for other compounds as well. This is the heptafluorobenzyl ester derivative, and they also have hexafluorocubane shown here. This is the repeating structure of perfluorocubane, and they also show that there's a weak fluorine-carbon interaction. Now the most exciting part is the single crystals. Here's a picture of some of the single crystals, and here's what a single crystal looked like under a microscope. Absolutely beautiful. I hope you enjoyed seeing these pictures of perfluorocubane as much as I did, and I really hope we can keep pushing the envelope of science to make crazy molecules like this. I'd like to give one last thank you to the authors for sending me these photos. It really made this video a lot better, and I also want to thank you for watching. Have a great day.